Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for logging on and attending this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, just a few things to note. Please let me know in the chat if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. And if you have questions, please submit them via the Q&A, and we will uh, address them at the end. Uh, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation and Lexington Living Landscapes. This is in continuation of a series of, pres of presentations in which Cary is partnering with Lexington Living Landscapes to bring experts in landscape and conservation issues to the public. Now, please welcome Georgia Harris. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are delighted to have you with us this evening. My name is Georgia Harris, and I am a member of the Lexington Living Landscapes Committee, the Lexington Field and Garden Club, and I'm the newsletter editor for Ecological Landscape Alliance. Before I turn the floor over to James tonight, let me tell you a little bit about Lexington Living Landscapes, which is hosting this evening's talk, along with our good friends at Cary Library. Lexington Living Landscapes was launched a little over a year ago for the purpose of encouraging more sustainable landscaping practices in town, more native plants, fewer invasives, fewer chemicals, and many more trees. We were created in partnership among four organizations, the Town Sustainable Lexington Committee and three nonprofits, the Lexington Field and Garden Club, the Lexington Climate Action Network, and Citizens for Lexington Conservation. Here at Lexington Living Landscapes, we're here to help you create a healthy, more nature-friendly yards and neighborhoods. To learn more about us, check out our website at lexingtonlivinglandscapes.org. You'll find a host of resources, including news of upcoming events and how to sign up for our newsletter. And we have a lot of exciting things coming this spring, so be sure to check that out. We want to thank James Lowenthal for joining us this evening and sharing his wisdom on this fascinating subject. And a huge thank you to Matt and Cary Library for co-hosting this evening's programming with us and to Lexington Conservation Division, our co-sponsor for this year's programs. Be sure to stay afterwards for the Q&A session with James. And it's moderated by Charlie Wyman, another member of the Lexington Living Landscapes team. If you have any questions, as Matt said, just put them in the Q&A and we will get to as many of them as we can. Let's get this evening started. James Lowenthal is, the Ameri is a Mary Elizabeth Moses Professor and Chair of Astronomy at Smith College. Professor Lowenthal uses the largest telescopes on Earth to study the formation and evolution of galaxies in the early universe, as well as exoplanets orbiting stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. He is a member of the American Astronomical Society's Committee on Light Pollution, Radio Interference, and Space Debris. Professor Lowenthal leads the Massachusetts chapter of International Dark Skies Association. When he's not doing all that, he spends as much time as he can outdoors in the dark skies under the stars. James, thank you so very much for joining us this evening. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Georgia. and. Uh, Cary Library and everybody for joining today. I see a, a bunch of familiar names here. Uh, Mary Jo, hi, Michelle, um, uh, Gail Walker, hi, and um, Zach, sorry, I haven't answered your email, but I, I will. Uh, <laughs> thank you everybody for, for coming and I hope we'll have a, a good discussion after I talk for a little bit about, uh, about light pollution from my perspective. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, show some slides. It's nighttime, it's supposed to be dark. The point is um, we seem to have forgotten as a society that it's supposed to be dark at night. People complain about it being dark. No, 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 darkness is good. We need the darkness. What is light pollution? Light pollution is excessive light at night made by humans. It's light that is poorly aimed so that it goes sideways or uh, or up uh, into the sky even, and not down where it's supposed to go. Uh, it's uh, light that shines onto neighbors' properties, uh, keeps them up at night. It's light that's on even when it's not useful. 
uh, it's uh, light that is probably 95% of light that you see poorly designed. Here at Tanglewood, I'm sure many of you have been to Tanglewood probably many times. And when you do, you might be blinded by this light on the side of the building. Here we are out in nature in the Berkshires, beautiful place, you're going for you know, a really special aesthetic experience. And for some reason, we just throw caution to the winds when we light the outside. Why is this such a problem? It's bad for human health. It's bad for human safety. You can't see anything else if the light's shining in your eyes. It's certainly a waste of money and energy. Nobody benefits from shining the light up into the sky. Of course, we lose our view of the night sky and it's bad for wildlife. Where by wildlife, I mean animals and plants, every species. A little bit more on each of these briefly. Uh, blue light is at night especially is bad for health. Why is this and, and what are some of the effects? The effects are dramatic. There are elevated rates of cancer, diabetes, obesity, sleep disruption associated with artificial light at night. Uh, here is just one of many, many uh, reports and references. That there's lots of literature about this. It's, uh, it's really not disputed that, that artificial light at night has negative effects on human health. Uh, this uh, set of studies came out of a longitudinal Harvard work uh, studying 100,000 nurses uh, for decades. Uh, so the statistics are very, very good. And they found here, I'm quoting, 14% higher rate of breast cancer in the presence of artificial light at night. And I'm talking about light outside. Here's another one in Spain that finds a one and a half to two times increase in cancer rates in the presence of light at night, measured by satellites looking down. How could this possibly be? Well, actually there's a mechanism that is identified and likely the culprit. We are hardwired to look for blue light. When the sun goes down, the amount of blue light uh, in, the, uh, in the environment goes down, your eye detects that, sends a signal to the brain, and the brain starts producing melatonin. And melatonin is a super important hormone that then cascades through the body and resets your body clock. Your whole circadian rhythm system is controlled by light turning into melatonin. And melatonin is a powerful cancer suppressant. So it makes sense that if we're flooding our, our eyes with light at night that suppresses melatonin, that we then have elevated rates of cancer. And there are various studies that, that corroborate this, uh, this perspective. It's especially bad for blue light. Here we see a, a rough uh, mock-up of a spectrum, meaning how much light comes out in the different colors made by different kinds of light. Here, firelight, almost no blue light at all. It's all red, uh, less than 2% uh, melatonin suppression. At the opposite end, here is a, a blue rich LED, like the kind that now completely dominate the market for, uh, for new lights. And you see there's this really big bump of blue here. And that is a direct hit with the human sensitivity uh, for melatonin production. Uh, so this production of blue light here suppresses production of melatonin. And it's not just in humans, but in, uh, in most, uh, most vertebrates. The American Medical Association came out uh, just five years ago with a report uh, it's a short read, just eight pages long, I recommend it, that, uh, that points out what the risks of this blue rich light are. Um, it's from the human perspective um, and it's, it's pretty clear and it's well documented and uh, they, they give a bunch of good scientific references. They, they point out not only the, the problem of, the, of lights being too blue, but also uh, the problem of glare. And the whole point of putting lights in the outdoor environment is to make visibility better you, so that you can see things for safety. And if we shine the light directly in your eyes, it's the opposite of that. So the AMA report uh, is a nice summary of all of that. Well, this glare thing, what's it about? Uh, how, how, does, how does putting light up outside make visibility worse? It makes it worse if it shines in your eyes. And we all know this from driving in a car, seeing the headlights of an oncoming car, you're blinded or the flashlight, if you shine the flashlight in somebody's eyes, they can't see anything else. With lights outside, here's a pole with a, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in the upper left, there's a light shining down. The yellow area 
is the goal. That's where the light is supposed to go, uh, the area to be lit. That's good. But all too often, instead, we design our outdoor lights so that they put out lots of light in this zone, the glare zone, that either is shining directly in this person's eyes or shining onto this neighboring building, whether they want it or not. It's far away. It's not doing them any good. They're not actually uh, uh, illuminating anything helpful, uh, helpfully, but they're getting the glare into their, into their windows, uh, into their eyes. It, and it's per perhaps even shining directly upward into the sky where it does nobody any good. So it's a complete waste and it's, it's harmful. Uh, here, there, there are numerous graphics that you can find online that show this sort of thing. Here is a building with a, a bad light on the side that's shining up into the sky and onto a neighbor's house and a good light on the other side that's shining only down. So glare interfere, interferes with good vision. This is the flashlight shining in your eye. This is the headlight of the oncoming car. And we all know this from experience. If there's that, that bright spot of light in your field of vision, you can't see the pedestrian. If only we could eliminate the glare, we could see much better. And this is not a new idea. It's been studied for decades. Uh, here is a, a, a study from 1975 pointing out how in the absence of oncoming lights, you could see over 700 feet down the road with the oncoming headlights that cuts down to only 200 feet. So it's a dramatic loss in visibility. So we have to eliminate glare. This is exactly what the Federal Highway Administration says. Disability glare, the glare that makes visibility worse, is one of the most important elements to control. It affects your ability to adequately see, particularly for older drivers. We often hear people say, oh, you know, I'm, uh, I, I can't see well at night, uh, and so I really I can't drive at night anymore. I think nine times out of 10, it's, it's, not, it's not you, it's the lights. If the lights were better, if they were better designed, you would be able to see fine at night. It is certainly true that, that as eyes age, they become less transparent, more susceptible to glare. But if we could just eliminate that glare, uh, we would all be much better off. All right, uh, other problems with light pollution. Light pollution is a pure waste. It doesn't benefit anybody. It's a pure waste of money and it's a pure waste of energy. Of course, we have to burn fossil fuels or, uh, or some other uh, source of energy has to, has to uh, be tapped to produce that light that then shines right up into the sky and illuminates the bottoms of birds. Uh, never the intention. Uh, roughly $3 billion a year in the United States wasted shining light directly up into the sky. Of course, light pollution robs us of the view of the stars. Here is a view of downtown Northampton on a mostly clear winter night with some of the brightest stars in the sky rising through this gauzy haze of light that is uh, pure waste. It's light that was not supposed to shine up into the sky, but it does. And it makes it practically impossible to appreciate the view that we have just a few miles away of the starry skies, the timeless beauty of the night sky, the magic and the splendor of the Milky Way that a whole generation of Americans is missing out on. I ask my students all the time, how many of you have never seen the Milky Way? And usually half the hands go up. And to me, this is heartbreaking and criminal. It's like asking how many of you have never seen a tree? or a rainbow. Here is a, a mock-up of what the Milky Way looks like under different light pollution scenarios from an excellent dark sky site here where you can see the Milky Way in all of its detail through suburban sky here where you can barely see the Milky Way at all. And then a heavily light polluted inner city sky like uh, middle of Boston or New York or Las Vegas. Uh, Lexington falls somewhere in this range right now. Let's talk about wildlife. Light at night is bad for wildlife, period. No wildlife benefits from light, artificial light at night. Blue light is especially bad. Uh, this screech owl on the Smith campus in Northampton needs darkness at night to thrive. Darkness a dark night, a naturally dark night, is its habitat. When we cause light pollution, we ruin the habitat.
mammals. About three quarters of mammals are nocturnal. Even the diurnal ones depend on darkness at night to thrive, like this bat, like this hardworking mom, like this fox. The fox and the possum are both here in my neighborhood in Northampton. Light pollution negatively affects virtually every one of their major functions from reproduction to uh, finding food uh, to uh, migration. And the, the big picture of ecosystems uh, also depends on a, on a dark night. It, if you light pollute, you cause effects that ripple through practically every ecosystem uh, and uh, every level of the food chain. Here are some probably better known examples of negative effects of light pollution on wildlife. This should not say millions of birds, it should say hundreds of millions of birds, up to a billion birds are killed every year in the United States alone from light pollution. They get confused, they get attracted to the city lights on their migration routes. They're flying by the hundreds of millions over our heads during migration. They get pulled off course, they get uh, distracted and disoriented. They circle around and around until they drop dead from exhaustion or they crash into buildings. Uh, the picture shows here uh, uh, dead birds collected on the sidewalk for, in one city. I think it might be Toronto uh, in, uh, in one season alone. Sea turtles, when, they, uh, when their, their eggs hatch on the beach, uh, they're programmed to head for the ocean, which they're supposed to find by seeing the glint of starlight on the water. Instead, they see the lights of the mall and they head for the mall the wrong way. And uh, these are endangered species that are uh, severely threatened by this new, uh, new to them problem of light pollution. So on the South Coast, Florida, Georgia, there's a lot of attention that goes into, uh, you know, not enough, but at least there is some into fixing that problem with better lights, fewer lights, less light pollution to save the sea turtles. Migrating birds. 40% uh, of birds migrate, and 80% of those migrating birds migrate at night. They're over our heads during uh, uh, spring migration in, in April and May, and, in, and again in October by the hundreds of millions. And many or most of those use the stars to navigate. What happens if they can't see the stars? All of these birds are warblers uh, that I saw in my neighborhood. Uh, they've flown up from uh, the Caribbean, from uh, South America, uh, on their way uh, north to Canada. That's a Canada warbler in the lower left. Some of them don't make it. Like this yellow-throated vireo that I saw dead on the sidewalk. One of those hundred million to a billion birds uh, that are killed every year. So it flew all the way up from the Mediterranean only to die on the streets of Northampton or in the sky of Northampton. It's not just on the ground. It's not just in the air. It's even in the water. Uh, light pollution affects virtually every ecosystem that's been studied, including riparian, including migrating fish, migrating salmon, Atlantic salmon, uh, including uh, plankton in, um, in the ocean, including far out in the ocean even, uh, where uh, fishing boats now blast the ocean with tremendously bright, bright lights to do their fishing by and inhibit what's actually the, the largest migration in the world, which is a daily migration of, uh, of microorganisms uh, from and, and plankton from uh, from deep depths to shallow depths at night, and in the presence of light, that migration is inhibited. So you can imagine how that is going to ripple through the food chain. There's a lot of research going on about this. There are many uh, programs devoted to the study of uh, the effect of light on uh, on uh, on animals and plants. Here are just a couple. Uh, the first one, Mary Harrington is my colleague here at Smith College, who's an expert in chronobiology, the study of uh, our circadian rhythms and how we're hardwired to obey a 24-hour cycle of activity that is regulated by light. Uh, Richard Stevens was a leader in this field, unfortunately passed away uh, recently. Uh, but here are some more institutes. Um, uh, here's one that's devoted completely to this issue, the Zoological Lighting Institute. Here you see everybody's favorite insect, fireflies, by the probably hundreds of thousands on a lovely July night on Elwell Island, 
in the middle of the Connecticut River between Northampton and Hadley. As the moon sets in the back, the fireflies are doing their thing. They're looking for their mates by trying to identify the flash of their particular species and identify that code from a distance and so the males can go off and, and, and find their mates, the, the, the females who don't fly. Fireflies need darkness at night. They avoid light polluted areas. You can see why, of course, they need darkness to see. And there are species of fireflies that are threatened with extinction solely from the effects of light pollution. We have a local hero or a couple of them at Tufts University. Avalon Owens and Sarah Lewis are two of the world leaders in this study, the study of the effect of light pollution, not just on fireflies, but on all insects. And they've written a series of articles uh, like this one and uh, this one pointing out that light pollution is a driver of insect declines. You've probably all heard of the insect apocalypse, or if not, you probably have the experience that I do that it doesn't happen anymore, that when you're driving down the highway, your windshield after an hour or two in, at the, on a summer dusk uh, drive is splattered with insects. And at least part of that is because insects are in a steep decline. There might be other reasons, windshields are more aerodynamic, who knows what else, but um, there's little question that insects are in trouble worldwide at the, you know, at really dramatic uh, existential uh, species threatening levels. And light pollution is one of those drivers. Uh, and um, uh, Avalon Owens has, has written eloquently about the role of uh, artificial light at night or Alan in that decline. Um, and in this paper, um, uh, she points out that it's not just about the light shining up into the sky, it's also the light shining down. Uh, we astronomers are worried always about the light shining up into the sky. And we always say, oh, point your lights down, point your lights down. The biologists say, don't point your lights anywhere. Turn your lights off. The animals don't want that light shining down. No animals benefit from it. This uh, insect apocalypse, it's gotten a lot of press. You've probably seen some of it. It's especially uh, big in Europe. In Germany, it's the main issue that uh, light pollution advocates are getting traction with, with the public and with the legislation. Um, here is a picture in, of the street light outside my house on a summer evening showing the hundreds of insects that are attracted to that light. They shouldn't be attracted to the light. They can't help it, of course, but it's not good for them. It's preventing them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's making them vulnerable to predation. It's upsetting the whole ecosystem uh, unknowingly. Uh, here is a whole list of uh, negative effects on different insects, different species uh, uh, of light pollution, ranging from uh, their development uh, uh, as individuals to their movement as individuals and groups, to their ability to forage, to reproduce, um, and um, to, uh, to prey on, on their intended prey. It's estimated that the total number of insects tops 5 million, only 1 million of those are described. Of those, if it's not fireflies, your favorite insect might be one of the Lepidoptera, a butterfly or a moth, of which there are about 180,000 species described. Almost all of those are moths, almost all of those are nocturnal. The effects of artificial light at night on nocturnal insects are really profound. There are some estimates that as many as one third of, intracts, of insects that are attracted to artificial light sources die before morning through exhaustion or through getting picked off by, by predators. Uh, it's estimated, here's a quote from Germany. I told you they, they studied this extensively in Germany, something like 100 billion insect deaths per, per summer. Uh, and this appears to be uh, showing up in now long-term trends. A 30-year study in, uh, in the Netherlands um, shows steep declines, steeper declines of nocturnal species uh, than uh, diurnal species that are not attracted to light. So it's not just the pollinators at night, it's, uh, it's the pollinators during the day as well. And uh, this was the result of uh, a study that also got a lot of attract, uh, uh, attention in the media. Um, this was a New York Times article that, that touched on it. Um, uh, here's a, uh, a Nature article that, uh, that talks about the, the threat to pollinators. 
Um, this is one that, uh, that actually found a, a dark field in the Alps in Switzerland, uh, measured the number of pollinating insect visits uh, to flowers at night, and then shone light on the field and measured it again, did it in controlled ways and very rigorous. And they found more than 50%, 62% fewer visits by pollinating insects in the presence of artificial light at night. And during the day, more than a 20% decline. So it just told the insects to go away or it killed them. And even the insects that were supposed to be out during the day, there were fewer of them. Here in Northampton, as in Lexington, we have a wonderful cadre of volunteers who are working hard to support pollinators under threat by planting pollinator gardens. Uh, this is the the beautiful jewel in the crown of Northampton's park system, Pulaski Park in the middle of downtown, recently redesigned uh, and redesigned with a pollinator garden. You see some of it here. Unfortunately, the city was not listening when we told them to be careful with the lights. And what they did is they put in these super bright, super blue, super unshielded lights that are bad in every way. They're on all night long on full blast. So what we're doing is we're attracting the pollinating insects by day, and then we're killing them by night. These lights are 10 times to 15 times brighter than some light in parks in New York City. Why do they have to be so bright? An international, uh, internationally acclaimed lighting designer came to this park and her jaw dropped when she saw the lights. Why do they have to be so bright? And of course, it's for safety, right? It, it's, it's always for safety. It always is a safety first mentality, but it, it doesn't really work. Uh, there's plenty of behavior that happens in this park that is unsavory, like this drunk passed out on the bench. It doesn't stop him from doing it. It's just giving him health problems. In fact, some people say, look, he was, he was perfectly healthy until he sat down under this light and then look what happened to him, poor guy. Well, that might be true, but uh, I think it's just the case that, you know, he's a drunk passed out on the bench. Uh, the light has no effect on, on that behavior. It, it's not making anybody safer. It could be 10 to 20 times dimmer than this, and it should be, and it would be just as safe. There would be no increase in crime, and that's been studied extensively for decades. There is no strong uh, correlation between lighting and crime. There's no consensus in the criminology field about it, even though there are strong biases. Um, and we can talk about that more if you have questions, but um, I'll make that claim. Back to the pollinators, of course, we even do our best to attract insects and kill them intentionally, like this bug zapping ultraviolet light uh, across the river from us in Hadley. Uh, it's meant to attract mosquitoes. Fine, um, attract the mosquitoes, but Mosquitoes are only 1% or something like that of the insects that are attracted to this light and then zapped to death. A lot of good bugs, including pollinators, are attracted and killed as well. Here we see the direct effect of dimming lights on uh, nocturnal insects. In the presence of, uh, uh, of full bore lights, bright lights, many more insects are attracted. If you just dim the light down, you get fewer light, fewer insects attracted. There's just no, I mean, of course, this is common sense. It's, it shows up in every one of those pictures we just saw with the bright street light attracting insects. It's, it's just quantified here. Uh, insects are, are um, irresistibly attracted to lights, or many of them are. At the same time, street lights reduce the number of caterpillars, which is to say part of the, the food chain, part of the life cycle. Uh, this study by, uh, by boys uh, from just last year in England uh, looked at the number of caterpillars that were found in hedgerows or bushes along the side of the road, uh, under lights and not under lights. And uh, you see that um, here one would be, uh, this is the ratio of um, insects seen in, in lit versus unlit. Uh, if it were equal, if the insects didn't care whether it was lit or not, then these uh, blue and yellow lines would all cluster around one. 
but they don't. They're all below one, which means there were always fewer insects in the presence of light. Uh, so this is not the flying insects now, this is the caterpillars. The flying insects are attracted to the light. The moth caterpillars, for reasons that we might not fully understand, are, are, are uh, there are fewer of them. In either case, we can see it's a strong effect. It depends on the kind of light and the brightness of light. Uh, and uh, we better understand this if we're concerned with saving insects. Everything I'm telling you is documented and, um, and corroborated uh, again and again in the scientific literature. And that's recognized in numerous high level, United Nations level uh, documents and statements, including this one from last year of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which put out a resolution calling for action to reduce light pollution. Here are a couple of quotes from their, their resolution. The impacts of artificial light at night affect many biological groups. A large proportion of animals live partially or exclusively at night, and a daily period of darkness is essential for all living organisms to alternate periods of rest and activity. It goes on to make eight recommendations, including uh, avoid overlighting, sorry, not lightning, lighting, uh, switch off the lights in the middle of the night, avoid upward lighting, avoid any illumination of a natural environment. This is a key point. We have all these conservation areas and then we blast them with light. Limit the risk of glare, uh, minimize the blue light. Similarly, I was involved in this United Nations uh, series of conferences and reports called Dark and Quiet Skies. Uh, our report from Dark and Quiet Skies 1 had a bioenvironment chapter, which I co-chaired. Uh, here are a couple of quotes from that. Artificial light at night can have significant effects on organisms and reduce the resilience of populations. And here what we've done is assemble the world's experts on these, these issues uh, to come up with a consensus document that uh, it's sort of like uh, the, the, uh, the United, United Nations IPCC, you know, get all the, uh, the climate scientists together and do a deep dive into the literature and document it and put it into one report. That's what we did our best to do. Artificial light at night uh, affects aquatic organisms, birds, insects, mammals. It affects migration, ecological function. I've said this already. Um, we also came up with recommendations similar to what we saw from the IUCN a second ago. So all of these sources agree on the, the negative effects and on what we need to do. World Migratory Bird Day coming up on May 14, I believe. It's been going for years and years and years. Every year they pick a different theme. This year, their theme is light pollution. I'm very happy to see this. This is much needed attention uh, among uh, birders who are often not aware of this issue. Uh, maybe some of you are birders and, and wanna talk more about this uh, afterwards. Light pollution is growing fast. Here was light pollution in the 1950s, in the 70s, in 1997, and projected for just a couple of years from now. You can see the whole Eastern seaboard, everything east of the Mississippi is just a wash in light. Uh, here is a, an article from just a couple of years ago by Chris Kaiba um, showing that light pollution is growing worldwide by over 2% per year. That's a lot. That's twice the rate of population growth. That means that on average, everybody's using more light and we have more people, that's bad. Here you see in red, the worst areas of growth are often in the developing world where suddenly cheap light is available, mostly LEDs, mostly blue rich, mostly too bright, unshielded, all the bad stuff uh, with obviously some benefits if they're able to, um, to pull themselves out of poverty by being able to work at night or, or be safer. But at the same time, we've just seen what the dire consequences of light pollution include. So it's growing fast. Here is a more recent study from just last year um, showing the increase in light pollution. Uh, the, the dots here uh, show the, the light pollution detected by satellites, uh, DMSP and VIRS are satellites looking down at the earth. What they don't see, those satellites, is all the blue light from LEDs. And if those uh, those LEDs have a particular color uh, shown in, uh, in these two sections here, we might be missing as much as this much extra light that has occurred in just the last few years. That's not seen by the satellites, but it's there. We're 
getting the effects of it. It's brightening the, the night sky. It's affecting our health. It's affecting wildlife. How about closer to home? Uh, here is uh, Boston uh, cosmopolitan area, metropolitan area, uh, shown in a light pollution map. This map is a great map, lightpollutionmap.info. I highly recommend it. You can scroll around and zoom in and out anywhere in the world and see the brightness of the night sky. Here, red is bad and uh, black is good, but there is no black. There's nothing in this area that's, that's not light polluted. The best you can find is this uh, blue over here on the left, um, and green is a little bit better than that. And uh, uh, here's Lexington right in the middle. That's why I chose this particular screenshot. This is in 2012. Okay, get ready. Here comes 2021. Here's 2012, here's 2021. So I'll go back to 2012, I'll go back and forth. And you can see that even those green and blue areas are just getting swamped. They're just getting overrun by this tide of light pollution flooding in. Uh, you can, from this map, click on an area like Lexington. If we click on Lexington, we can see the trend with time of light pollution in Lexington rapid rise in just the last year. And here these numbers uh, give you in a bunch of different uh, uh, units, a quantitative sense of the, the brightness of the, the night sky due to artificial light pollution. Uh, for example, this number here, ratio 10.9, call it 11. That means the sky is 11 times brighter than the naturally dark sky. Here in Northampton, it's about six times brighter. In the middle of Boston, it's probably, uh, depending on where you are, um, 25 to 50 times brighter than naturally dark sky. Oh, and that was in 2015, it's, it's worse now. So how does this happen? How do we get there? Why is it getting so bad so fast? And uh, why is it so hard to stop? Here is a picture of my street in Northampton. Uh, here is a street light right in the middle that happens to be malfunctioning right then. And it was in a blinking phase. And I, I took a picture when it was in its off phase. Uh, I could see the stars. It was beautiful. I was happy. Uh, there's when the light was on. This is the old light. This is a high pressure sodium light. It had been there for probably 50 years. It's the lights that most of us grew up with. It has been replaced. I knew it was about to be replaced in 2016. That's why I took these pictures. It was replaced with a bright LED, like the great majority of uh, lights that have gone in the last few years. And every light that's gonna go in in the next 10 is gonna be an LED. Uh, here's what they replaced it with. It went from this to that. And this light, this new LED light is actually one of the better ones. It could be worse. This light actually is not shining directly into the sky. It looks that way in this picture, but that's just because it's so overexposed. Uh, you, you can't see any of the, the detail of where the light's going, but it's super bright. There's a lot of glare. It's much more blue. Um, it's, it's bad in many ways. And uh, the city did it uh, over our vociferous opposition. We were unable to get the city to, to really listen to um, the options that they had and should have taken and the choices they should have made. And this is what we have now. So how do we fix this problem? It, this is happening everywhere. It, uh, it, you know, every time I, I go to Boston, I just, I, I, it makes me heart sick to see um, how much worse it's gotten, how quickly. Um, here in, again, Northampton, Pulaski Park, um, this is looking up from the parking lot in the back of Pulaski Park, the parking lot where they're about to put in lights like these, only brighter. These lights are shining. Here's our pollinator garden. This is the, these are the lights that are 10 to 15 times brighter than New York City parks. So how are we gonna fix this? It's simple. First of all, there's just some simple rules. Don't shine the light up. Don't shine it out. Shield it so that it goes down only. Don't do this. The light is shining everywhere, even up. Send it down only. Uh, here, just another example of one of those, um, uh, those many, many graphics that we see. Uh, you can find these on the web. Uh, here is a light that's uh, shining directly off a building up into the sky uh, into neighbors' windows where somebody's cursing it. Uh, instead, shine the light down where it's intended. Um, here are examples of, uh, of bad lights that shine everywhere. 
Here are examples of good lights that shine down only. Um, again, very bad lights on the left, uh, bad, better, uh, best lights on the right. Uh, again, uh, productive light is down only. The glare zone is right here in these low angle, just below horizontal. And uh, any light that's above that is complete waste. When you install the light, install it exactly horizontal, not like this, like this. You know what they were thinking. Uh, you know that on the left, they were thinking, ah, um, our parking lot is off to the left and we've got this light in the corner and we wanna shine the light all over the parking lot and on our building. But what they get is a beam of light that does this, including shining up into the sky. That was not the intent, but that's what it does. This works perfectly well. Put the light horizontal and you'll, you'll get better light without the glare and without the uplighting. And you'll be able to use fewer watts. It's more efficient. This was a, a light at a bank here in Northampton uh, where the bank was willing, this is our, our local uh, co-op bank uh, credit union, was willing to hire somebody to come out in a cherry picker and adjust the lights to point them down. Unfortunately, tons of lights are made with these hinges and they get installed. I would say the great majority of them are installed at you know a 45 degree angle. They should all be horizontal. So here's something, you know, if, if it's bugging you, you can uh, maybe convince uh, somebody to fix it. Now, we're familiar with this. This should not be an alien idea. Think about your favorite live theater back in the day when there was such a thing. Uh, we all know, we all know that the lights in the theater are carefully designed. You could go to school for years and get a, an advanced degree in lighting design, theater lighting design. And the basic rule you learn is don't shine the light in the audience's eyes. The lights are carefully shielded to prevent that from happening. They shine on the stage. There's plenty of light in the theater. It's bouncing off of the stage, diffuse. You can turn to your neighbor and see your neighbor perfectly fine sitting in the audience, uh, but you can see the stage without glare, without that flashlight or headlight effect in the eyes. On the stage, of course, they're blinded. They can't see the audience, but it's a simple concept, isn't it? Why do we forget that when we move outside? Okay. Number two, minimize the amount of blue. It's really critical to control the color. And here is a terrible example of bad lighting that unfortunately the, the Northampton Planning Board approved because they just didn't understand their own rules and they didn't have a, any kind of limit on the blue light. Uh, this is a new development at the former state hospital. I would hate to live in that house and have this super bright glaring blue light blasting into my windows all night long, every night. Many cities around the world are coming to their senses about this issue and choosing lights that are very low blue content or even amber like this one in Quebec. Blueness is measured in the Kelvin scale. The higher the number, the more blue. So 3000 is the maximum amount of blue light that the American Medical Association recommends. Um, here you see a list of cities and towns that have chosen lights 3000 K or less including some that are now uh, going down to 2200K. It seems like a revolution. It's, it, it's just, uh, it's, um, it's so bold. Wait a second, the lights that they're replacing, the old high pressure sodium lights, those were 2000 Kelvin. That's what we grew up with. The new LED lights are the problem. The first LEDs had uh, ratings as high as 5000K, super, super blue, terrible in every way, uh, but the industry pushed them hard. And now there are cities that have those for the next 20 years. Now, then it came down to 4,000, then 3,000. Now, the, uh, the majority of cities and towns in Massachusetts that are doing LED retrofits are asking for 2,700K or less. And, and here are a couple of examples uh, uh, in Massachusetts, Pepperell and Rockport that have recently or are about to install 2,200 Kelvin. Number three. Minimize the brightness, use only as much as you need for the, the purpose and no more, and use it only when you need it. Turn it off or dim it down when it's not needed. It's not hard to do. Here is a typical street light with this little black thingy on the top. It's got a photo sensor. All the street lights in your town as in mine have one of these. It just looks for the sun to go down, gets dark, it turns the light on. It's a, it's a dumb system. 
but you can make it smarter. You can buy a different one. This one uh, you can buy for less than 50 bucks. It's got a timer in it. It, it says, oh, okay, after midnight or two o'clock, you can set it to whatever you want. Turn it down to 50%, turn it down to 25% or turn the light off completely um, after two o'clock in the morning when, uh, when there's, there's practically no need for the light. The lights are on all night long at full blast. It, when everybody's inside, that's a total waste. Here, everything I've been telling you is codified in these five principles for responsible outdoor lighting. And this was a real coup. This was a joint effort of the International Dark Sky Association, which is fighting, its mission is to fight light pollution and save the night sky. The collaboration between IDA and the Illuminating Engineering Society, which is a, an independent third party sort of, um, you know, industry related uh, uh, engineering standard setting group. The engineers in your town, as in mine, turn to the IES for their recommendations. How bright should it be? Um, what are the recommendations for a parking lot, for an entryway? The IES and the IDA together came up with this list of five principles that are like motherhood and apple pie. All light should have a clear purpose. Who would disagree with that? Light should be directed only to where needed. Okay, makes good sense. Should be no brighter than necessary. Well, that makes sense too. Should be used only when it's useful. Turn it off or dim it otherwise. Use warmer colors, minimize the blue. Your town could, could adopt these. And if, if you could adopt it at the highest level so that it filters into um, all the different decision-making um, agencies and offices of the city, uh, that would be a great thing. Um, one office in Northampton, the Energy and Sustainability Commission has adopted this uh, and we're, we're hoping to implement it at a larger scale. Looking specifically at Lexington's case, you've actually got a pretty good code on the books. Um, the, here are the two parts that, uh, that I found. This is um, uh, in, in the general code, and uh, this is on for site plan review, and it's got some really good language in here, including uh, that the light should be uh, shielded, fully shielded with no uplighting, uh, that um, uh, glare should be minimized, uh, that uh, the color should be 3000K or, or less, meaning less blue. Those are all good things. And, um, I have some recommendations if you want to strengthen it, um, but a first question to you would be, is it enforced and how well is it enforced? Um, and I have some other ideas for how to strengthen if you want to talk about that more. At the state level, we have been trying for 30 years to pass legislation protecting the night sky from light pollution. We are closer than ever right now. In the current legislative session, we have these two bills, the Senate and the House bills you see here, that call for these things that are consistent with all the, the recommendations I've told you about already, full shielding, uh, uh, minimal blue, um, no brighter than, than necessary. And we also say the Department of Transportation needs to get on board and, and, uh, and adopt best practices. And the Department of Public Utilities has to stop charging you for electricity that you're not using. Here's the way it works. Um, the minimum tariff level for a street light is 25 watts. 25 watts is a lot of LED light. That bright light that I showed you outside my house, house the LED is too bright. It's only 19 watts. We could get by with 10 watts or less. Pepperol is dimming theirs down to, to uh, five or six watts at night, but they're getting charged for 25 watts. That's not fair. It's a disincentive to do the right thing. And, um, and it, it is one of the causes of light pollution. So our state bill would, uh, would force the DPU finally to adopt low power tariffs. The good news after these 30 years, our bill was reported out favorably from the relevant committee, the Committee on Telecommunications, Utilities and, uh, and Energy. And the Senate version is now in the Senate Ways and Means Committee. And we're working as hard as we can to, uh, to get this bill to the governor's desk. <clears throat> if there's one thing that Lexington can do to help it along, it would be write a letter saying Lexington supports this. Northampton has written that, a few other towns have. It'd be great to have Lexington's help with this. You can certainly uh, uh, email or call your senator and representative. Make sure that they're on board. Make sure that they are uh, co-sponsors. We have over 30 co-sponsors, but we need more. Very happy to have your help with that. All right, in summary, 
light pollution is bad. Light pollution is bad for humans and, uh, and animals and plants. Uh, it's bad for public safety. It's bad for the economy. It's bad for quality of life. And of course, it ruins the millennia old heritage that we have inherited uh, from countless generations of a dark night sky uh, that we no longer have. And light pollution is easy to fix. It's not like climate change or water pollution or plastics or air pollution that lingers long after it's been made. Light pollution, you just flip the switch and it's gone. It doesn't last. And we can fix it easily by adopting these simple rules. Shine the light down only, keep lights on only when they're needed, um, keep the light level low, minimize the blue light. It's all win-win. I'm gonna uh, leave you with two more slides here. One, this one reminding you of the importance for wildlife in the following sense. Nobody would think that, that wetland animals could survive if you took the water away from the wetlands, right? We all know water is an essential part of wetlands. The animals, the frogs, the, um, the salamanders, uh, uh, all the aquatic animals, all the uh, vernal pool animals, they all depend on the water. They also depend on darkness at night. Just as water is part of their ecosystem, darkness is part of the ecosystem. They've evolved to depend on it. Their, uh, their uh, health and welf welfare depends on it. And it's up to us to protect that. And then finally, this last view here of uh, Comet Neowise uh, during the pandemic from the bridge over the Connecticut River, uh, a, a fabulous site that people struggled to see because of the competition from light pollution. This should have been seen by everybody around the world. Instead, it was seen by a slim few who were able to get to a dark site and, uh, and get away from, from city lights. Um, but um, it's out there, it's waiting for you, it's magic. Uh, the night sky is, uh, is restorative, natural darkness at night is, um, is essential and beautiful and, uh, and full of joy and mystery. And one of my favorite things to do is to bring people out into it and, and help them, um, you know, maybe face their fear of the dark, even if they won't get over that fear, uh, but at least to, uh, to start to get a taste for uh, the beauty and, and, and mystery of the night. Uh, and impress upon everybody the importance of, of protecting that. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, stop the share now and very happy to uh, take questions and, uh, and hear your comments and thoughts. James, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, let me remind everyone, if you have a question, type it into the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, in the next few minutes. Um, so, and before we start the questions, um, just one point. If there's anyone in the audience who wants to sort of continue to delve into this subject, whether you're here in Lexington or elsewhere, if you want to email us, we'll connect you with each other and we can set up a Zoom, you know, just give you a chance to, um, to uh, explore the issues that James has raised tonight, um, talk about what can be done, what can be done in Lexington or, or your town, um, just let us know and, and we'll connect you. Uh, so James, we have a number of questions uh, and let's dive in. Um, Elizabeth writes, I have often worried about trees that are in direct light all night. Could you talk about how light impacts photosynthesis in, in trees yes. in general? Yes, trees and, uh, and many other plants, including agricultural uh, crops, are directly affected by, uh, by light at night. Um, it, um, it changes their annual cycles. Uh, uh, trees leaf out earlier and they stay longer, which subjects them to, um, to, to stresses that are, um, that are not good for them. Again, it's a change in the ecosystem that is, uh, that is unintended and it ripples all the way through. In the case of crops, um, I don't have one uh, right at my fingertips, but you can search online and find pictures of of a field with a, a, a street light on the edge of the field, and uh, the, the crops are apparently flourishing underneath the street light. But it turns out it's more complicated than that. They, they produce more green, but less, uh, less of the, the intended agricultural product. You know, it's not something that we're, we're trying to control. It just happens um, uh, by our, our mistake. Um, so there, again, there are lots of pictures you'll see online of, of trees with, um, with uh, more leaves right under the light. Uh, 
and and fewer away. So it, it, we we put things out of balance by doing that. Good, good. Thank you. Um, a second question. Lexington recently replaced its street lights with the more adjustable, more warm hued wavelength of lights. It should be more downward facing. I'm shocked to see how much worse the light pollution in Lexington is in the past year. Do the street lights need to be dimmer or is most of the light pollution coming from lights in commercial parking lots and private houses? It's hard to know where to focus our efforts for change. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. yeah, yeah, plenty, Sarah. Um, you you definitely uh, pinpoint um, a, a really uh, thorny question. In general, roughly half of the light pollution comes from municipal sources, uh, street lights, and parking lots, and the other half is our porch lights and uh, commercial properties and security lights, so-called security lights, which don't actually provide any security, um, and uh, you know, uh, gas stations and uh, car dealerships. So it all needs attention. And your uh, Lexington code says, oh, this code does not apply to our own lights. This is typical, cities and towns almost always exempt themselves from responsibility uh, in their own lighting codes. And, and that's, that's gotta change. Um, our statewide bill would apply only to state and municipally funded projects. So actually it does address exactly that problem, but it does not address the private and commercial uh, uh, usage. So they're both important. And what we really need is, is uh, holistic um, uh, control. And while you mentioned the, the state bill, let me point out that both of Lexington state senators, uh, Sidney Friedman and Mike Barrett, are on Ways and Means. So now would be a great time to contact uh, each of them and let them know that you're very supportive of, of this bill. That would be fantastic. Uh, Mike Barrett, of course, was the um, was the the co-chair of TUE for for many years, but uh, but not now. And I uh, would be very happy to have your support. I didn't answer another part of your question, Sarah, which is specifically about the Lexington streetlights. Um, I'm happy to help you figure that out. Uh, if um, we could, we should take it offline. Um, if I find out what was installed, then I can help you figure out what can be done to help improve it. The chances are good. That uh, that the lights that were installed, uh, the street lights, are controllable, and that they are not being controlled, or, or that they're not being sufficiently controlled. I talked about the um, the kinds of controls that can go on the top of the street lights. Uh, Cambridge, for example, uh, controls theirs so that the city engineer can pull it up on his cell phone and turn off individual lights one by one, or the whole grid or neighborhoods can see which ones are out and which ones need to be fixed. Uh, dim them down to 50 or 25 percent late at night. Pepperell's doing the same thing. Uh, that's that's definitely the way it should be done, and that can be done with a retrofit. Um, uh, someone asked, "What impact do internal lights shining to outside have on the problem, and, and do yeah. trees help?" Yeah, trees do help, and it. Uh, I have a colleague, Martin Aubey, in Quebec, who is the world expert at modeling exactly how the light gets from the light source to the sky or elsewhere. And trees play a big role. It makes a big difference whether they're, it's in, in leaf or uh, in the winter, um, whether the, uh, you know, the, the tree is this high or this high and how close to the buildings they are. All these things actually matter. The, the question of internal lights uh, is not much. It, um, the great, great majority is the lights that are actually outside. Even if you go by a typical house that, that has all the lights on without window shades, probably the biggest offender is still gonna be the porch light in most cases. So I would say focus your attention on the outside lights before worrying about the inside ones. And, and someone asked um, if you have recommended sources, um, sources of good lighting or there's some kind of certification of lighting, how does a homeowner know what, what's going to be a good outdoor light? Yes, absolutely. Go to the uh, go to darksky.org. Darksky.org. That is the website of the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, we have a Massachusetts chapter that we're very active. Uh, we're the we're the ones who have uh, written and are pushing that bill. Uh, we have helped many towns work on their own bylaws. Uh, we've got a lot of different programs going. Uh, um, I see another question here. Um, are there other towns that are working on this? Yes, many. I'm wondering about towns on Cape Cod. Yes. Um, Oh, I just heard about, somebody just told me about a town on the Cape. 
not Wellfleet, not Truro, not P Town, uh, a town on the Cape that uh, that she visited, uh, where the neighbors said, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, we all turn off the lights at eleven o'clock, and we love it that way, and we all want it to be dark." And I think it's written into the into the code as well. Um, so yes, uh, uh, Gail Walker is here from Nantucket and has spearheaded uh, the efforts and huge efforts in the last couple of years to make Nantucket dark sky friendly. And uh, there is not only a certification process for individual lights, if you go to the IDA website, you'll find their um, uh, dark sky uh, friendly fixture seal of approval. So they certify good lights uh, that are dark sky friendly. Um, they also have a program to certify cities and towns and, and communities as dark sky friendly communities, which is something to aspire to. And James, in addition to Nantuck Nantucket, are there any other towns in Massachusetts that come to mind as particularly good models um, for people to look to? Uh, it's tough. Um, uh, I would say Pepperell has just done a good job. Uh, Rockport has done a good job. Gloucester, not too bad. Uh, Cambridge, as I mentioned, is uh, is uh, at least controlling its lights with with smart controllers. Um, there are way more bad examples than than good, I'm afraid. Uh, here's uh, one. Um, Peter asks, why in the southern hemisphere are stars brighter? <laughs> is is that true? And uh, they got they get the best stars. It's true. Yeah, uh, it's because <laughs> um, it's because the Milky Way. Is a big ring that circles around the Earth in a sort of asymmetrical way, and the Southern Hemisphere has a better view of the middle of the Milky Way, where there are more bright stars. Um, Mimi asks, um, "Can you tell us about? Well, you've already, uh, to some extent, answered this, uh, asking about plants and light pollution." Every you species just... studied, every species is is affected, and it's and the news is always bad. There's not, I don't know of one case where uh, where artificial light at night has benefited a species. There's a wonderful book called The Ecological Consequences of Artificial Light at Night, I believe, by Rich and Longcore. It's, um, it's 15 years old, but it's still a go-to resource. Um, go to the dark and look, uh, Google dark and quiet skies uh, and look up the bioenvironment chapter, and you'll see references to, uh, to, in the literature to scientific studies about all of that. So it, it, the news is always, always bad when it comes to light pollution. Um, Susan asks, looking at the maps, it seems pretty clear that much of the light pollution is centered around highways. You mentioned DOT is part of the solution, but are there focused approaches to get at this? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by uh, focused approaches as opposed to the DOT. Um, uh, the, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thorny issue. The good news is uh, there, there's some there's various cause for good news. Of course, the bad news is uh, all the retrofits are happening with with bad LEDs that are too blue, too bright, poorly shielded. Um, but there are some good examples. The state of California has a general rule that they don't light highways, except in special cases where it's shown shown by some study or another that it's needed, which is probably a questionable result anyway. But um, their default is we're not lighting the highways. There are many miles of uh, Mass Pike and I-91 here in Massachusetts that are not lit up. Um, there's always a temptation to throw light at a problem. When a crash happens, you know, somebody argues for light. Uh, but in fact, the, the evidence is very, very slim that it's solved by throwing light at it. If we're gonna have light, at least make it good light, at least make it shielded, at least make it uh, low and blue. And that, for the most part, is, has not happened. So, it, and that that is exactly what we hope to do with our statewide bill. If the statewide bill doesn't pass, we'll still keep hammering on on mass dot. You know, here in Northampton, there is a a big mass dot uh, project, a big roundabout that's at the intersection of Route Nine and Route Ninety One, I Ninety One uh, roundabout, it's right next to the Connecticut River, and. Uh, they're going to blast it with a million lumens of bright blue streetlights um, that are going to destroy the riparian habitat right next door. And they claim it's for safety. And it's just, 
it's it's crazy. So we've been fighting them, and you know they don't they don't answer our our emails, and we've got our legislators trying to work on it, and it's it's been a, an uphill battle. We'll get there. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions about neighbors. Um, you know, I, I first heard you a year and a half ago, and I became much more aware and started turning off lights at night and and uh, turned off even turned off my motion detector on the garage light because I mean I just turned off the light period because it just wasn't necessary even if an animal passed under it at two in the morning um and and several but I've got a neighbor across the street whose garage light just shines right over to us um and into the sky and several people have asked how do you approach neighbors do you have advice on how to do that I know someone asked if this presentation is going to be available and it will be on the Terry Library YouTube channel, channel, but do you have any other suggestions? Yeah, I suggest cursing under your breath and, you know, keep it inside for year after year. <laughs> uh, it's the, it's the possibly the hardest challenge, how to talk to your neighbors. Isn't that, isn't that funny? But it is, it's so true. Um, it's much easier to, to complain to, um, to a politician. It's, it's hard to complain to a neighbor. These are people you want a long-term relationship with. So I guess um, my advice is, uh, you know, really focus on the relationship and um, and uh, and there actually is a lot of advice about this. There's a whole section of the IDA website, how to talk to your neighbor about their lighting. <laughs> so everything I could tell you, you could you can just go read there. They have even a, a template letter that's dear neighbor, you, you have every right to do this and to do that. And, you know, and I love you. Um, but would you please consider the following? So um, I can't say, I, I, here's what I try. Uh, I, I made up a sort of obnoxious uh, two-sided flyer that's a, um, an audit of, um, of lighting. And uh, it, it's, it's got a, one side that's an FAQ about why glare is bad, why blue light is bad. And, and on the front side, it's got all these pictures like the ones I've shown you. So I can circle them and say, look, your light is like this and, and you know, it's doing this wrong. It's not a very friendly thing to do. But what I did was uh, go around door to door. I, I spent, I probably spent a thousand dollars on light bulbs that are better light bulbs for their porch lights. And I, I knock on the door and say, "Would hi, I'm your neighbor, James. I, I just wonder if you would try, if you would indulge me in a little experiment, if you wouldn't mind letting me swap out the light bulb, if you would consider changing your fixture, I'll even help you pay for it or I'll help you do the work yourself uh, so that the light shines down only. Or I might start by saying, I'm sure you know you have good reasons for your light. I'm sure that it's for safety and convenience and so that your elderly guests won't trip as they're coming up your stairs. And that all makes total sense. Is that true? But I'm I'm also sure that you don't intend to shine it across the street into your neighbor's house. Is that also true? So those are just some ideas for how to start. Um, it's it's a tough one. Yeah. And can you remind us if uh, someone wants to go to the uh, IDA website to look at the resources there? What's the URL again? I'll put it in the chat. It's darksky.org. That's simple enough. Yeah. Um, James, someone writes. It seems odd that LEDs are promoted as more energy efficient um, and that's helping to reduce climate change. And yet there's such a light pollution issue. Um, they ask, how, how has this happened? How, how did we let this get away yeah. from us? This is the, the classic, it's a classic case of the Jevons paradox where you make something more efficient uh, and you, you predict that therefore we're gonna consume less of the resource because it's more efficient and instead the opposite happens. It's more efficient and so therefore it's cheaper and everybody consumes much more of it. And that's why we saw that graph of light pollution going through the roof, uh, not just the 2% per year, but probably much more. Uh, it's because uh, LEDs are so cheap. They are more efficient. They are better for the environment if we didn't use them wastefully. The, the, the problem is our social love of light or our social hatred of the night our fear of the dark. It's a social problem and we have to grapple with that. And we have to realize we're making choices as societies uh, to light up the outside at our own peril. And we have to understand that peril in order to, to fix it. Um, LEDs are, are, look, I've got LEDs all over my house. All these lights in here, they're LEDs. They're definitely, 
Yeah, they're of course they're better. They use a fraction of the energy. They last forever. They're great. You can get really good ones. You can get ones that have minimal blue, that have zero blue. It's the technology is there. It's a solved problem. The the unsolved problem is the social and economic part and and political part and um, the fact that if you go to uh, Lowe's or Home Depot and you see a rack, a whole wall of of outdoor lights. There's security lights and there're blasto lights and there's super bright blue lights and and um, and they're shining up into the sky and uh, the, everything that I've said is wrong. They're all right there and they're cheap and you can buy them. And as a result, everybody's doing that. So um, it's possible to fix that. Um, Charlie, great to hear of of your uh, your good efforts there at your own house. We do the same thing at our house and. You know, our neighborhood is, I think, arguably darker as a result of my efforts over the last few years, but I still have light poking me in the eyes from my neighbors that drive me crazy. Um, Kevin has a comment, which is that DOT, state, and municipal agencies should all consider light quantity reduction. Inventory of assets would reveal that on average, an owner's inventory could be reduced by up to 20% with no detrimental effects on safe streets and suitable visibility at night. Uh, and you've been telling us that for the last hour. No, but that's exactly, it's a great point. And uh, uh, the state, so uh, Kevin, you point out about uh, Smith, uh, Smithfield, Rhode Island. Uh, the state of Vermont, uh, 10, 15 years ago, maybe more, uh, statewide instituted a policy of lighting audits for to help cities and towns reduce their energy uh, cost by identifying street lights and parking lot lights that were not necessary. And there were some towns that removed 75% of their lights, recognizing immediate savings as well as immediate benefit to the, the nighttime environment. And so, yes, a lighting audit is a great tool. And if you can convince your city or town to conduct one, that's a terrific way to start. Another way to start uh, is to hire a really good dark sky friendly lighting designer. And uh, I can say this with no um, uh, conflict of interest. I don't get any money for saying this, but, uh, and there are plenty of bad lighting designers, but if you get a dark sky friendly lighting designer, they will absolutely be worth their weight in gold in helping the city make good decisions. Those are great ideas for us, thank you. Um, Sarah writes, many of us have taken seriously Doug Calamy's call to plant plants that specifically feed lepidopterans, caterpillars and moths and butterflies, as a primary species for songbirds, underpinning much of our local terrestrial food webs. Can you connect nighttime adult lep lepidopter and demise due to light pollution, the lack of food for birds, and the worldwide bird populations collapsing that we've been hearing about for years? Yes, um, I am sort of at the limit of my direct familiarity with the articles, but I can point you to the sources that um, that will lead you to those articles. And my colleagues in biology say, yes, absolutely. Uh, we follow the food chain all the way through. And um, Annette krupsch Banesh, who's uh, some of whose slides I showed you today, and, and Avalon Owens and, and others are, uh, uh, Sibylla Schroer in Germany, are experts at studying exactly that, the, the, the food chain, the ecosystem webs that are affected starting, as you say, with insects and rippling through um, uh, to bird populations to uh, the very top of the food chain. Um, again, I, I, I don't have my finger on the numbers right now, uh, but if you, for example, if you go to, I'll put another link in the web, uh, in the chat uh, to the bioenvironment. Let me see if I can pull that up. Okay. Uh, the bioenvironment's working group report of dark and quiet skies. Uh, and it is... Yep, I've got the link, and now I'll. So I just lost my chat, and there it is. Okay, uh, so that link should bring you to the bioenvironment report that has a lot of uh, the references that will guide you to the science if that's what you're looking for. Great, thank you. Um, Maria asks, what about the solar landscape lights? I have them to, to light my walkway. Should I get rid of them? 
Um, yeah, th those are popping up like mushrooms, aren't they? Um, they're, they're, they can be relatively innocuous if they're, they're not too bright. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about them, but if you really want to do it right, yes, get rid of them. Uh, the, the bugs don't want them. They don't need them. Um, if you need a light along the walkway, the best thing to do, uh, the other problem with the solar light, well, there are many problems with them. Um, uh, as I say, it's not, it, it's probably not the most important thing to focus on. It kind of drives you nuts after a while if you see them everywhere. Um, some of the problems are most of them are too blue. If you can find ones that have warm color, that's definitely better. Uh, most of them have uh, sort of crystal and plastic sides where the light goes out and up into the sky. That's not their intended use. It should go down only. If you can find ones that go down only, that's much better. And um, they don't last long. They tend to get chewed up by lawnmowers and snowblowers and people tripping over them. And, and they're, they're made cheap and they're made disposable and they get disposed of. So we're just creating more plastic and throwing it away. Uh, that's my experience. If you wanna do walkway lights, if you must have walkway lights, the best thing to do is to spring for um, actually uh, underground low voltage wires with a properly designed uh, sort of knee high or at most waist high um, controllable dimmable, uh, nice amber color, uh, fully shielded walkway light. There are plenty of them available. There's some right across the street from my neighbor who fortunately was was willing to do that. Um, there's, there's a great, um, other solution, if you still want to go cheap, uh, these things called uh, deck lights, not walkway lights, but deck lights uh, that are the way lights are supposed to be, a light in a can. And they're cheap, you know, maybe 10 bucks each. Um, and you can get them in warm colors and they're solar powered with a little rechargeable battery. And I use those uh, on, our, um, on our back porch here when I need a light at all. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah adds a note uh, after your last comment that uh, she says, you are correct. The Lexington street lights are controllable and she'll uh, follow up with you uh, on straight street lights here in town. So great. Thank happy you for, to, for mentioning that. Happy to, to, to follow up with that. Uh, Dick asks, is Lexington enforcing its light pollution rules? And he notes that no houses on his block have been built with bright lights which shine everywhere. Um, so it's not a, question that we think you can answer is more for us to, to research. Um, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, if, if anyone uh, who's on does. Um, I think, um, yeah, so this is a, you know, all politics are local case where you probably have to know the building commissioner, you have to know the uh, zoning board of appeals, you, you're going to have to figure out where the levers are in the current Lexington administration, and it might change at the next election. Um, Ideally, there should be some structure in place in, in the town that holistically looks at this because it touches on, on all these different departments. It touches on Conservation Commission, Public Health, Department of Public Works. Um, if you have an Energy Commission, uh, you know, the planning and um, sustainability, the built environment, there's probably no single office that deals with all of that. Uh, so you might consider forming a local group or, a f or maybe forming an official group if you can get the city to agree to it. We've been unable to convince Northampton to do that. So we just do it ourselves and we, we keep you know sniping from the sidelines. Um, the enforcement is a, is a tough one. In most cases, it's like many other building code violation issues where it's complaint driven and the city just doesn't have the resources to go enforce you know, the rebar and the concrete and the plumbing and the electricity and the lighting. So they wait until somebody complains about it and then they come out and they, they measure it in a silly way. They don't understand the light pollution. They don't understand glare. They make a measurement. They say, oh, we don't think it's a problem. And then where are you? Um, so, you, you know, it's gonna take some patience and, and education and finding um, who your allies are in the, the town government and working with them. We, we got such a stonewall from our mayor in Northampton he wouldn't meet with us for five years. Um, would not meet with us, would not talk with us, uh, even though we have a lot of expertise, a lot of committed uh, volunteers. Um, so instead we went to our city councilors one by one and uh, you know, just took them out for coffee and a, and a sit down and a talk about our issue. And we've, we've built up these relationships long-term that way. 
And that's how we got to the point of getting the Energy and Sustainability Commission to adopt the five principles of responsible outdoor lighting. So now we have them on record. And when they put up terrible lights, we can say, wait a second, that's in violation of you know the five principles that you adopted. It's taken a long time to get there. And I'm curious, is there any communication channel, a Google group um, for light pollution activists around the state to learn from each other, stay in touch, there, there's, ask questions? There certainly is. Um, I will drop into the chat now um, the website, the URL for um, IDA Massachusetts. Here it comes. Whoops. That's our local chapter, the, the Massachusetts chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. Um, there are some other folks on here who are active in it. As I mentioned, Gail Walker, uh, and I see some others as well. Um, we have uh, a lot of experts on here, including uh, the main author of the American Medical Association report, as I said, who lives in Gloucester. Uh, the editor of Sky and Telescope magazine, or former editor, Kelly Beatty, who uh, is maybe known to some of you and is, is big in the amateur astronomy world. And, um, uh, and we've built up these relationships with legislators and, and other decision makers over the years. Uh, so very happy to have your, your help and uh, we need it. And yes, we have a, if you go to that website, you'll find our, uh, how to connect to our Google group list. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Dick asks, uh, are there good references on light, on the fact that light does not provide safety? or is of limited value, you know, when that's often the argument we hear. Um, can you point us towards sources that, that help us to refute that? Yes, um, th this is a, a complex thorny issue, um, crime and safety in general, and uh, the effect of lighting on, on those. Um, it's uh, controversial. Um, as I said earlier, uh, people have strong biases. The police uh, generally, I uh, believe and maintain that lighting is, is crucial for safety and that it's the second most important element in, in community safety after community policing. That's what our uh, former police chief said uh, to uh, convince the city council not to adopt the, the lighting curfew that the planning board was proposing. Um, and I stood up and, and gave a long, uh, not a long, but I gave a spiel uh, with, with uh, illustrated with slides and, and uh, studies showing uh, the, the ongoing controversy, the lack of consensus about the effect of lighting on crime. And uh, instead they listened to the police chief and it, you know our curfew went down the tubes. So there is a lot of study over decades about the effect of lighting on crime there is no consensus. If it were such a clear effect that you always had more light, you always had less crime, wouldn't we know it by now? Instead, we don't. People are still arguing. For every study that shows, oh well, no, the, you know, crime went down, there's another one that says, nah, there was no effect at all, or crime even went up. If, if lighting led to less crime, then New York City would be one of the safest places in the world. But it's not. It's just not. It, Crime goes up, it goes down for all sorts of reasons, right? Just think about the last two years. Violent crime is going through the roof. It's 50% it's increase. That has nothing to do with light pollution. There are so many factors that affect crime that have nothing to do with light. So uh, what we have to do is balance that observation that yes, some studies show some positive effects, others show negative, there's no consensus, but there is very strong consensus that light pollution is bad for human health, that it's bad for safety on the roadways, that it's bad for the welfare of animals and plants, and it's bad for our, our night sky heritage. There's no question about that. So why are we letting this questionable result drive everything that, that's a, a bad policy? Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, James, Mary Jo asks, and, and I've heard this before as well, she says, I recently heard about the amount of light from satellites orbiting the globe and the increase predicted in such aircraft with the concern that they might get so prevalent that they will interfere from seeing the night sky unobstructed from anywhere on earth. Is this a realistic possibility? I'm sorry to say it is. 
Uh, yeah, this has actually mm -hmm. consumed uh, much of my life for the last two years. If any of you have seen uh, the movie, Don't Look Up, um, the, the, what happens in that movie, all of us in this, in this advocacy world, specifically around the satellites, are like, that's it, that's our life. Um, it's unfortunate but true that the night sky is undergoing a dramatic change as a result of uh, so-called mega constellations or very large uh, uh, networks of satellites that are being launched by the, the, uh, the tens and hundreds. Uh, the primary one right now is Starlink, which is owned by SpaceX, which is owned by Elon Musk. Um, they have already, in the last two years, doubled the number of active satellites in orbit. So it took 60 years to get to 2,000, and then it, get to, it took uh, just two years to, to get to 4,000. 4,000 is going to look like nothing in a few years. By 2030, that number is going to be over 100,000. And it's not just SpaceX, it's OneWeb, it's Amazon Kuiper. It's the, the nation of China, it's the nation of India, the, the nation of Rwanda just filed for 330,000 satellite network. Um, so every, every nation is planning to launch their own. And uh, some of these are, most of them are very bright. They're bright enough that it's causing terrible problems for astronomy. It's potentially an existential threat to astronomy, to ground-based astronomy. And uh, well, I, I point you to the dark and quiet skies. There's a whole section of that on specifically the satellite issue. We have two more, uh, we had two conferences this year and last year called SATCON uh, in the United States focused exclusively on the issue. We just opened a new uh, uh, center funded partly uh, by uh, government support um, uh, by the International Astronomical Union, the IAU Center to study exactly this problem, interference from satellites. It's not just in the optical, it's also in the radio. And it's not just for astronomy, it's also for casual observers. Those Starlink satellites, they're as bright as the brightest stars in the sky went shortly after launch. Uh, by the time they go to their final altitude, uh, they're dimmer, possibly below naked eye, uh, but they're all, they're, they're always gonna be hundreds of them going up and down, we're always gonna see them. It's already changed the sky. And one last thing about that, uh, it's greatly increasing the chance of debris from collisions. Uh, space is getting very crowded, and that debris causes a general diffuse brightening of the sky that is, some estimates show, could be as high as 400%, you know, five times high, uh, brighter sky than natural sky uh, by the time uh, the, the currently planned satellites are actually launched in, within 10 years. So that could have devastating consequences for not just astronomy, but for all life on Earth that depends on darkness at night. So that's an extreme end bad news scenario, but it is not unreasonable. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea. I had no. I think most of us had no idea. Um, there are several questions that are sort of Lexington specific, and I think are pointing um, the way for us to do some more research here in town. For instance, someone asked uh, if anyone knows if um, the new center project, we're having our Lexington Center uh, renovated. Um, and they're wondering if it, anyone has taken lighting um, design into account um, in thinking about these concerns. Does anybody um, know so, the answer? Yeah, if, if anybody else can contribute an answer to that, I'd, that would be very helpful. Yeah, throw something into the chat, please. I would suggest starting with the planning office. Yeah, and um, our engineering department, uh, and there's a, a Lexington Center Revitalization Committee, that would be um, a good place to chat. Uh, again, well. again, if, you, if, if it hasn't started already, this conversation in town, my suggestion would be uh, start with the five principles and start at the top, try to, get, uh, try to get the very highest levels of government to adopt the five principles and have them filter down. If that's not possible, then you might have to choose more targeted approaches. But those principles, once you get people talking about them, they can lead to much, a much more um, educated decision-making process. And uh, it, it, you don't need to be super tech savvy to agree that the light should go down and it should be on only you know, when and where it's needed. Once you, you inject that into the conversation or start that conversation, I think um, it's likely to produce uh, good results. And, and we can find those five principles on the 
uh, darksky.org. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Well, James, uh, we've kept you for an hour and a half. This has been wonderful. Um, great questions. Great this. conversation. Thank you all so much for, for your uh, passionate defense of the night sky. Well, thank you. And let me mention to everyone that within a couple of days, well, a couple of things. One is uh, that Matt will post um, a, the recording of this um, webinar on the library website um, uh, fairly soon, and we'll put a link to it in on the Living Landscapes website. But in addition, um, and Matt in, I think the chat said that he would send around um, some additional references um, to everyone who registered in addition to a link to the, to the webinar. And in, on the Living Landscapes website, um, uh, we have past event resources, and we will shortly put up um, a link to the recording and a number of the um, of the links that you've provided um, to us tonight, James. So um, we'll try to get that information out. And if anyone emails us and says they'd like to be stay involved and and uh, talk more, then um, please do, and, and we'll connect you. And I look forward to uh, having uh, anybody who's interested join our uh, our IDA Mass group and our Google group, and uh, we'll see you all for the celebration of our our statewide bill passing. And write your senators, write your senators, and let them know. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, and Thank thanks you, to James. everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, and stay safe during the storm tomorrow. <laughs> yes. all right. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Bye, everybody.